Welcome to Rising Tide Startups, where today's most exciting solopreneurs share their startup stories. They also deliver tangible strategies that they would implement personally if starting their business over today. Each episode is a startup masterclass. Make sure you take notes. Take it away, Kevin. This is Kevin Pruitt with another episode of Rising Tide Startups, and my guest today is Ryan Obernessa. Ryan, thanks for joining us on Rising Tide. Yeah, Kevin, thank you so much for having me on. I truly appreciate it. Well, I gave you, I gave him about a 30 second heads up that I'm going to change the very first question on him. So, you know, I, I want to, I want to keep my guests on their toes. So uh, Ryan, like this, this is our first guest that I've ever asked this question to. So if you were at a networking event, how would you introduce yourself? Yeah. So my name is Ryan Obernesser. I am in Utica, New York. So a little city in between Albany and Syracuse, New York. And my, my wife and I started a fitness facility back in 2014 uh, in a town that Forbes ranked the number three worst place to start a business. Uh, but like we talked about earlier, it's uh, I guess we wanted to prove them wrong, you know. And uh, so in that time, we've grew the business to uh, become very successful um, and very profitable, which has then led me into the consulting world now, working with other gym owners and fitness entrepreneurs, helping them navigate the the roller coaster that business is, um, and you know, helping them achieve. I think ultimately, what we all want as an entrepreneur, which is some level of freedom, uh, whether it's financial or time, uh, and that's where I spend most of my time now, uh, is in the consulting world. So, I, I don't know that we've ever interviewed anybody specifically that that ran a gym. I think they've had training. I, I take that back. There was a, a lady in Australia that that started a a gym, but. You know, you've seen so many gyms come and go, you know, they're, they're there, they, they have the $9 a month, you know, uh, registration, they're banking on the fact that three fourths of the people won't, won't actually use that. And then maybe six months later, a year later, they're gone. And then maybe some, another gym comes in or, or whatever. So what is the, what's kind of the secret to longevity in the whole training space? Yeah, so uh, for us particularly, uh, what we did is went the opposite route, is we wanted to bet that we could get our, all of our members or as many as possible to keep coming to the gym. So uh, instead of going the low dollar amounts, um, and I would say little value, uh, pretty mm. much just to show up and work out. I think that's uh, fair. Our mo- yeah, our, our, our model is based on a higher dollar amount, but also higher higher value. So we're really trying to create uh, more than just the gym, but it's a community. Uh, you know, we have a lot of coaching and everything that we do. Uh, so that way the people who are coming actually have a support system to be able to keep up with it. Uh, and I really think that that is something that separates the facilities that last long-term versus the ones that, yeah. you know, you talk about that fizzle out, um, is they try to help their members achieve their goals and continue achieving their goals versus trying to first achieve your business goals. Right. Uh, I think, you know, I think that other model, like you said, is, Hey, we're going to just see if we can get as many people to sign up and hopefully nobody comes and uh, it's the, uh, throw spaghetti on the wall <laughs> yeah. you know, and see what sticks, you know, motif. But, uh, so I, I, I love the, what the idea that, that you wanted to kind of, uh, I'm assuming you a much higher price point, but you, you would need fewer members to, to kind of offset that or to kind of reach that, I guess, equilibrium point that you're trying to reach. But, Tell me how in the world did you get started in this? I mean, is it where you just, you know, what you just worked out all the time and, and just, I mean, that seems to be kind of the, the starting point for people that run gyms is that they just, they, either they were good at good athletes in high school, worked out a lot, or they, are they like me, they needed to do something to change their physique at some point in time and they got serious about it. So what was your story? Yeah. So uh, my story, uh, a little bit different in that, uh, you know, going back to when I was a kid, uh, the interesting thing about me, I didn't go to the first day of school until I was 15 years old. Uh, so I was just always riddled with this anxiety and worry and you know issues with self-confidence. And it wasn't until my father got us a family gym membership when I was in junior high, uh, took me to the gym with his, his good friend. We started to work out and I started to realize really the power in being able to change yourself, mm. uh, you know, and you know, take accountability for your actions and get into habits and I started to notice not just the physical changes, but more importantly, the mental changes, you know? So for me later on in life, uh, that was really what drove me towards going into fitness as a career is I wanted to help people achieve that transformation, uh, that, you know, really truly can change their life. And 
you know, at our facility, we, we have a flagship program here. We call it take back your life. And that's why is it's, it's more than just fitness for us. Um, and I really do think that that's the catalyst to change. Uh, I always tell people, Hey, you know, the workouts and the nutrition, like that's just the vehicle to get you to change. It's not, right. uh, that's not the secret. Like that's just how we can convince you to do these other things that are going to change your life down the road. Do you, have you seen like, the is there i mean i hate to say a you know formulaic there's a formula for this but i mean do you see that if you change the physical it also changes the mental um it sounded like to me i mean you may have started seeing some you know some physical change i mean you may have you, you know you may have gotten a little ripped and you you know had a little more confidence in, in when you look in the mirror type thing and you think you know why am i quite as anxious as i was before you know or why am i worried about what people will think or see or whatever so do you is there is there kind of a linear progression that you know you get better physically and and that will improve your mental you know state as well yeah well 100 and i think one of the things that we, we pinpointed it down to is a lot about control is that you know for people especially when you get into adulthood and you've had kids and you have a career and all of these things have kind of you know taken you every which way uh, that you now are looking for something that you can control and how can you gain back right. control of your life? So for us getting into just that one habit, Hey, you're going to come to the gym three days a week. If you can get that nailed down, now you start to realize that, Oh, I have the power to do this. What mm. else can I do? Yeah. And then, you know, we work on nutrition and then it is really, really cool to see that transformation where someone sees that, you know, Hey, if I can do this now, what else can I do? Whether it's mm. in your job or, you know, in your family or adventure, you know, that's really the cool thing for us to, to witness in the fitness world uh, is, Hey, it's really great. You're going to lose this weight or it's really great. You're going to transform your body. But what I care about is what do you do after? Mm -hmm. Like, what are you going to go and do with that? You know? So I do think it's a pretty big catalyst to start with the physical. Yeah. Did you, did you start from scratch or did you take over an existing gym and kind of change the business model or how, what was your startup story? Yeah, I started from scratch. Um, I had worked as a personal trainer. I uh, wasn't really making much money at the time. And uh, I knew at some point I was running out of time and I wasn't getting enough out or enough money in the day. So the only thing you can do is to go out on your own. Uh, and I had originally planned an opening in the current facility that I was working in. Uh, and well, a friend of mine actually was, uh, his father owned a building. He's like, hey, we got to go show it to someone. Uh, they want to rent it for a car shop. So it was a warehouse building kind of off the beaten path and we walk into it and I was like, dude, this is perfect. Like, you know, really like I, I want it. And at the time Call I them back really... and tell them it's not available. <laughs> yeah. So we had to wait and we, we waited to find out they didn't take it. Um, and I didn't have a, I had been doing on my own, like researching business plans and putting mm -hmm. together ideas, but I didn't know anything about business, you know, uh, but I, I still told the, uh, the landlord is I want it. Like we're going to take it. Um, and, one of the things I know people worried about financing. I, I do believe money's never the obstacle. It's mm. like in seven days, we found the money. Like I found friends, family, clients, and we got the money we needed to be able to you know, get our equipment started and get things moving. Um, and you know, three or four months later, I think after that moment is when we opened the training facility. So it happened really, really quick yeah. once we found the spot. Um, so yeah, it's uh, a little interesting how we, how we got there, but it worked. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it, it was a great transition though, because you were already in the personal training space. So you yeah. had, I, I guess, a client base that, so did you, did they actually move from where they were a member to over to your new gym? And how was that little, how was that little divorce that, that happened in the business yeah, space? Um, I thought they were going to. <laughs> <laughs> that was the great um, hope on the business plan. <laughs> yeah, no, we, we, we probably had about, uh, I'd say, maybe 40 to 50% that came over. Um, again, I, I, I thought everyone was going to do it. Uh, that's one thing I've learned over the years, uh, especially in the consulting world is anytime you change locations, it doesn't matter if you're going two feet down the road, but yep. just because you're changing, uh, there are going to be people that aren't going to come. There's yep. anytime there's a change, it's an opportunity to leave is what we found. So, if you and I are jumping on the elevator, we're going to go up 10 floors and I, I am, you know, I live in your area or whatever. Give me your very best elevator pitch about the services that you provide in the next 45 seconds, because we're only going up about eight floors. And it's going to go ding here in just a second. Yeah. Uh, so assuming Kevin, that you're a, a 
a gym owner, uh, services I provide as a coaching consultant to you is to give you the systems, um, the tools and strategies, everything that you need to accomplish the three main things in your business, which is number one, going to be to acquire clients uh, and more importantly, acquire them in a profitable way. And then to be able to service those clients at scale without creating overwhelm in your business. Uh, and then lastly, to be able to build up a sales system and process where you are consistently bringing in uh, new sales and specifically the, with our model is building out a higher ticket sales system, uh, which ultimately will give you that time freedom and financial freedom that you've always wanted as an entrepreneur. Uh, so that way you can take the vacation, you can get home and spend time with the kids, you know, so on and so forth. Okay. Ding, the door opened. I took your business card and I'm going to call you tomorrow because my gym is really struggling and, and I need, I need somebody to come in and overhaul my system. But so the best, I think the best uh, training courses are those that were literally born out of kind of the, the hits and misses of the, of the creator of the course. So is this, I mean, is that true in your case? Did you, did you build this really based on your own experience, you know, in building your own gym? Yeah. You know, and I think what you said is exactly right is, you know, in, in the beginning, uh, like I said, I, we weren't good at business. Uh, so we, we didn't do very well for a little while until we had started to figure some things out. And then you start to realize, you know, what works, what doesn't work. Uh, and over time, we can narrow that down into a packaged you know, course or product, like you said. Uh, and it, it really, it speeds up the process for anyone else. You know, I, I think that's one of the most valuable things with coaching and consulting is that you learn from the mistakes someone else made. So that way you don't have to make them uh, because uh, it's a not fun to do it. <laughs> it's great because there's always a lesson, but in the process of doing it, it's not always the best experience. Yeah. So, you know, COVID has hit the entire planet. There's, you know, one great big pause button. And one of the, one of the, you know, the businesses that got hit really hard would be gyms, you know, gyms, yep. restaurants, theaters, you know, anywhere where you're gathering people in kind of a critical mass. So how did you help, you know, gym owners kind of navigate that, that very difficult time over the last, say 12 to 18 months? Yeah. So I took a, uh... I decided for, for my facility and then also for our clients that the thing uh, I really wanted to instill in them is to lead with abundance. And at the time I, I was reading uh, Danny Meyer's book, Setting the Table, and he talks about uh, his restaurants in New York during 9-11. And they had, at that time, restaurants were shut down, things weren't good. And he made the decision to lead, in a, lead with abundance, even while you're in scarcity. And then also from a leadership standpoint to really, uh, you know, like a true leader is someone who absorbs fear and exudes hope. Uh, so that was really the message that we put across, uh, like I said, in our training facility and for the clients. So instead of pulling back and, you know, trying to hunker down and just survive the storm, we actually expanded. You know, we immediately took online pro an online program that we created for our members. Uh, we started to sell online pr products. And then once we had that up and running, it was transitioning and taking that process and course we that we took and giving it to the consulting clients so they could do the same thing. Yeah, did you I mean, did you see gyms go to more online training versus on site training? And was that part of how you were training them? Yeah, so there were uh, really two camps during that time. Uh, one was that some gyms decided to hey, we're going to close our doors. Mm -hmm. so hopefully this isn't going to last very long. And then we're going to reopen. Uh, the other side of things were like, we're going to keep things open and we're going to double down and provide even more value than we ever had to our clients. So that way we can keep revenue coming in. Um, and then we could eventually grow into an online program where we can start to sell it. Um, so there was definitely a good portion of facilities that did that. Um, and I think to that point, uh, most of the ones that are still around today uh, are there because of that, because we didn't yeah. lose a good portion of the industry. Yeah. Did you, uh, do you, also teach gym owners how to create their own courses? Is that part of it? Or is it really your course really is just geared toward teaching them how to run their own gym better? So it, within that coaching and consulting program, uh, there is a portion of that, which if needed, it gives them really the model for training and nutrition services mm -hmm. and things like that, that we utilize. Um, the, the one thing that I guess coaches and gym owners tend to be good at is training. Like right. They tend to have that piece down is they, they, they know a training program, they know nutrition programs, but it's putting it into a systemized approach to, to deliver to clients at scale that becomes the obstacle. 
Uh, so it's more so helping them systemize what they currently have. Uh, but for some of them, if they do need it, that's something we offer you. Yeah, it's not a great advertisement if you're if your gym owners, you know, <laughs> weightily challenged and his t-shirt stops about halfway down his his gut and he's sitting there, you know, at the front door. So yeah, I mean, most gym owners that, that you see are are, you know, they're they're in good shape. They're they're pretty, you know, cut and you know, they they certainly are a, a testimony to, I guess, the product or service that they're that they're trying to trying to sell. But so what is what was the biggest thing that that you did that really moved the needle? You said, you know, you kind of struggled early. What was that one aha moment that you had that's that you can look back and you can say that's where the game changed? Yeah, the uh, biggest thing I would say is understanding the power of singularity of focus. Uh, so early on, uh, we were trying so many different things. You know, we were trying this program or that program or this message. And uh, it was just uh, at the time, she was my girlfriend. Now she's my wife, but it was just the two of us. And we were so spread thin trying to do all of these different things. I, I even joke today, I think we had probably 80% of the sessions that we do today with a team of 10 that we did back then with two of us. So uh, we were trying to do so many things and it just wasn't working. And we really uh, took our business upwards and you know, took it vertical when we just went all in on one thing. Then that's where we created our flagship program. And hey, this is what we're going to start to market. This is what we're going to advertise. This is going to be the main thing we do in bringing clients into our businesses where things really changed. So do you still actually have the brick and mortar gym or is everything now geared toward the training gym owners on how to run their, run their own? I do. Uh, I do still have the brick and mortar gym actually currently inside of it right now, up, up, upstairs in office <laughs> as, as, as we talk. As do you, do you think that helps you kind of stay current and, and like a practitioner that, you know, you're, you're all, you're still learning as well as you, you're kind of doing it, you know, for yourself, and then you can then continue to teach others and grow? Or would you think you would stagnate maybe a little bit if you if you weren't actually practicing as well? Yeah, I definitely think it's beneficial to have the in the trenches experience. And you know, you can test different things, and you can really see and uh, I think more importantly, hear what's going on, uh, you know, on a on the ground floor level. Um, also, especially in the last year with the consulting space, uh, a lot of people have become consultants and coaches and yeah. many of them don't own a gym. They're more marketers than anything right, else. Right. And they've never actually run a gym. So they don't know the systems. They don't know the people. So I do think it's an advantage to have that and be able to also showcase like, you know, I've had clients that come to the gym. They want to see it. They want to see yeah. how things run. So yeah. uh, it is a, it's like having your own laboratory, I guess would be a good way to look mm -hmm. at it. Uh, and it, it has been beneficial. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking about like, if I was, if I hadn't started one yet and I wanted to take your course on how to start one, it would, I, I mean, I'd love to have come and, and watched you, you know, and maybe shadowed you even like a, they're almost a mentorship program type thing. Or, I mean, yeah. I, do you have apprentices that you, that would come and say, Hey, I, I want to spend three months just kind of watching your gym run, watch it operate, watch, look at the systems, the things that you've got going on. And, and that way I can kind of replicate that. I mean, I know that you're, you're, teaching that in your course, but yeah. you know, sometimes there's nothing like actually just getting your hands, you know, in right there. Yeah. Well, we don't currently have anything as in depth as that where they're going to come for months. Uh, we just have people generally come in and like for a day, they want to shadow and watch, right. um, you know, we talk about their business and then they can also take a look around and hang out and see how the coaches we have run things. Uh, but it would, that would be a great thing to be able to have eventually is to have, you know, some sort of long-term process where they stay and hang out and really learn the ins and outs. Cause you're right. There's nothing better than that firsthand experience. Yeah. Hey, you're welcome to use that idea. It's free. <laughs> I don't have to have any credit. It. That's right. You, you, it's, I've forgotten that I even gave it to you. So, yeah, but I, I mean, I could see that, that even, and maybe it's advantageous that like, almost like you're having interns, you know, that, that would come and, you know, spend you know, spend the fall or spend a summer or whatever, because I think it would be invaluable for them. You know, I mean, I, yeah. I would have come and worked for you for free for three months just to just to really get an understanding of what you're trying to do, you know, and, and yeah. wanted to do virtually everything like, you know, want to spend a week doing that. I mean, from emptying the trash to, you know, helping you with your books and everything in between. But um, yeah. what are what are some of the things you you've struggled with? you know, just running your business that have been really beneficial in kind of building your course? Yeah, I think um, two main things really, 
uh, that come to mind. Number one would be in uh, leadership in the beginning. Mm. Uh, you know, like I, I thought I was a good leader being captain of our football team and you know, all that stuff, but leadership in business is different. Uh, Wait, can I, I stop you just for a second? Did you say you didn't go to school till you were 15 and now you were captain of the football team? By the time I was a senior, yeah. <laughs> That's a pretty stark transition. <laughs> I mean, it's like, it's like, you, you told a story and you here's the end. Like, Wait a minute. Oh, there's a lot in there in the middle. We did. We kind of skipped over was. So what was the I mean, how, number one, I want to say I want to go back and just touch on that. How are you received in school when you actually came, you know, as as a freshman or whatever, however old sophomore, however old you were when you actually stepped foot in the school? And then, you know, was it because of the training that that enabled you to you know, kind of transition into that. So, football. um, is, so in, in years prior, I, I did attend school, but I would never, I could never go to the first day or like first week of school. Oh, okay. Okay. You know, I would, uh, um, I think the worst year I was out for two weeks, I would mm -hmm. get so deathly sick and anxious, um, that and my mom always thought she, I was lying and not, maybe not lying, but over exaggerating. So I think when I was, uh, when I was in second grade, she made me go to school. And she had my grandfather walk me to school because we lived down the street and I threw up on the front doors of the school because that's how nervous I was. Now, and, mom, I'm going to show you this is real. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it lasted like a wow. first day of football practice, first day of baseball practice, lacrosse, whatever it was, it's just new experiences, meeting new people. It got me so anxious. I'd be sick to my stomach. So um, it was it, I did actually go to school. It just oh, okay. I missed like the first week. Yeah. So to, to, I guess to your point in I think eighth grade was the year I missed two weeks of school. I, I was the strange kid of like, Hey, you mm. just like, where have you been the first two weeks? You know, and, yeah. you know, um, out, outside of that, uh, I think I put on a good poker face. So people never really knew, mm. you know, cause I, I did play sports and things like that, but they didn't know that, Hey, in the locker room, I was throwing up before the game or Hey, like, <laughs> you know, I, I tried to hide those things. Um, Your first at bat, every baseball game, you, you were over. <laughs> I never got a hit the first at bat, but I was, I, I was nails after that. <laughs> My, uh, I played, I played little league for two years. I only played baseball for two years. My first year, I didn't hit the ball once, <laughs> but my second year, I was pretty good. I was, I think I was like number two on the team in batting. So <laughs> that, that's, that's true, what happens you know? when, you, when you stick with it. That's right. When it, when, what, that, what does, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. There you go. So that, yeah. That's exactly the motif. Yeah. I'm not, I'm certainly not trying to make light of that because I know it's, it is, it is certainly real. My, my third daughter, my third child, um, had, two girls in her class uh, we actually lived in england at the time that literally missed two complete years because they had such anxiety about going to school that they would get yeah. to school they would get dressed every day wear a uniform go to the front door couldn't make it in the in the building go back to the car and go back home and it's it is yeah it is it is very very real so um and it is it's interesting your story about you know how you kind of tied you know the the gym experience with, you know, overcoming that a little bit. And I mean, would you say that's, that was the direct, you know, I guess, antidote for, for whatever you, we know was going on at the time. Yeah. Um, and I think more so the reason is that as I got into, it's like 12, 13, 14 years old is, uh, I was a little chubbier. Like I wasn't very large, but I was chubby. And my, my, my friends at the time, they would, like say I had, you know, had man boobs or they would make fun of me. Mm -hmm. Um, like in, I always played it off. Like I didn't really care, you know, but yep. like those things started to hurt. So when I went to the gym and I started to change my body and those things went away, that's when I started to realize that, Hey, I can change a lot of different things about myself. Yeah. Um, and that really led me down the path of like change, like personal development in college. Like, I guess there's another piece to that story where like in, in college, I wasn't, uh, I guess I wasn't a good person. I would say I was kind of just a mean, miserable meathead, I guess would be mm. the best way to say it. And, uh, uh, it really wasn't until I started to follow that personal development path more that I worked on the mental side of things too. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think a lot of it came back to, you know, that resentment from being a kid and dealing with yeah. those things. Right. Uh, so, you know, that's what really led me into the fitness business. Um, and starting that was, I, I connected the two dots that, Hey, these two things are connected. Um, and if I can put those together and help people, you know, we're going to be able to make a massive transformation in their life. So was there a time in those first months, couple of years, whatever that, that you said was kind of a really kind of a slow grind 
that you thought, what am I doing? Yeah. <laughs> Why I, uh, am I doing this? <laughs> I can remember distinctly of, uh, so we, my, my wife and I would come in to coach our sessions. Uh, so we had a 5.30 a.m. Um, large group training, we would call it. And then we had a smaller group training. I would take the smaller group. She would do the large group. And after the session, we would go in the office and we would go underneath the table or our desk. And there was a dog bed. And we would lay there and, and take a nap. And I can remember laying there and, and literally those words of like, what are we going to do? You know, it was uh, I, I, like so many times we had a couch that we had upstairs and we'd sit on the couch and ask, we would ask each other, like, what do we do? We didn't, like people weren't coming in the door. We didn't know how to get them in the door. We didn't mm. know anything about marketing or sales or any yep. of that stuff. So yeah, for that, like the first year, it was a lot of sitting and waiting and wondering, like, hope. What, do we, what do we do now? Yeah, hoping people, you know, we did the, like the fairs and health fairs and expos and you know, all sorts of stuff like around radio. the neighborhood, passing out flyers and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. And it just, it, it wasn't turning anything um, in, into the gym. It wasn't bringing people in. So uh, yeah, for that first year, especially it was uh, really rough in figuring out what to do. So was there, was there an outside influence that, that, I mean, were you, were you following people online that were running gyms? Were you, you know, did you take a training course? Did you do something that that where you gain that knowledge, or at least the kind of the cursory knowledge that you started with to kind of, kind of change the momentum a little bit. And then, or what was there really that catalyst? Yeah. Um, I a hundred percent, it was one, one moment specifically. Um, and I'll tell you what led up to it is I started to, uh, look around at, at other gyms and, uh, there was a company called training for warriors. Uh, there's a guy, a gentleman, Martin Rooney, relatively well-known in the fitness space. And I noticed that there was this other guy in a picture with him that I knew he owned a gym about 10 miles from mine. And I knew of the gym, you know, I didn't, I didn't know him personally at all. Um, but I just known him from the area and I'm like, well, how is he involved in that? And that kind of took me down a rabbit hole of seeing that, oh, they do some business coaching and he had a business partner and, you know, all of these different things. So I reached out and I, I saw they put on a big business event um, down in Florida. So I reached out and just, Hey, I've been following you uh, for the last couple of years. I, we opened a gym, you know, down the road. I uh, just wanted to say how awesome it is like an inspiring to see that. And I did that in hopes that he would contact me. And he did. And he asked if we could get coffee. Uh, so we went and we had coffee. He told me about his business coaching and consulting that they did and offered me an opportunity to do work with them. And I, at the time, I, I think it was $1,500 a month. And I didn't have that. I was making right. like $700 a month. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so I went back and, you know, I really thought about it. And I, like, I didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I consulted with my father-in-law at the t you know, at the time about that. And he had, he had experienced that he's in the financial um, advisor industry. So he knew about uh, business coaching and consulting is like, well, it, it could be worth it if it's, if it's, if it's a good fit, you know, a good person. Uh, and the next day I got a message and said, all I want to know is, are you in yes or no? That was it. And I said, yes. And I was like, that was what changed that, that moment there would change the trajectory of our whole business. Cause I got exposed to learning about sales systems and marketing systems and, you know, putting together checklists for employees and processes and all of these things that I had never thought about before. We were just all right. doing, doing whatever we needed to do to get by. And uh, it was really that moment that, that I really took things off. And that was a, that was a course or that was kind of an ongoing going coaching plan yeah. or mentoring. What was it? That would, uh, like a one-on-one -on -one mentorship. It was an ongoing coaching plan. Mm -hmm. So how long did, did, did it take? I mean, there's always a little bit of a lag period there, you know, between, you know, you, you gain knowledge and before it actually starts kicking in to, to generate, you know, the, yeah. that income. So how long did you, was it before you started seeing a real difference? I would say, uh, I think in six months we doubled our revenue. And that's so you were, you were breaking even on the course cost by that time. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it paid for itself you know, 10 times over in the first year. Yeah. And it, uh, it, again, it was, we, like, we didn't have memberships. We had month to month contracts, you know? Mm -hmm. So once we started to develop a recurring revenue stream, then we could start to build on that and build a foundation. Yeah. So it really took off in that first six months. It was, it was, it was pretty quick once we got that one thing in. So what are, what are a couple of other things that, that, uh, were, were obstacles that you kind of had to overcome? And I mean, it, it's not like, 
you know, you, you struggled, then you took this course and all of a sudden everything is just unicorns and, and, you know, a parade. I mean, were there, were there growing pains then about, you know, you talked about, you know, like becoming a good leader and, and, yeah. you know, if, how do I, how do I manage staff? What, what do I need to have in place to, as a training program, even for them type things? So what were some other things as you grew that you really had to, had to focus in on to, to overcome? Yeah, specifically with the leadership as we grew and you know, one of the goals. So when I, when I opened the training facility, um, owning a gym was never the goal. It was just a stepping stone to get into something more, uh, whether it's speaking, writing, coaching, I've always wanted to, you know, have that as a platform to launch. So once we started to do well with the gym, uh, again, not being the best leader at the time, I probably got my ego a little too big and tried to just completely step away with no direction for mm -hmm. people. And I realized pretty quickly things crumbled. And, mm -hmm. you know, that was my first lesson of, okay, that's not how you do things. You have to like put together a plan and a system and explain and, you know, have a vision and core values and, you know, all of these processes and things that we have now in our business that it didn't exist back then. Um, so really that was a big uh, I, obstacle is, Hey, we're doing really well. And then all of a sudden, you know, getting smacked in the face and yeah. realize, hey, you're not as good as you think you are. Uh, so that was a, a big lesson um, over the years of figuring that stuff out. I mean, it's almost like a, like a selling your business. It's almost like a business exit. I mean, there's a lot of parallels between, you know, the founder stepping out, even if he still owns it, he or she still owns it, that somebody else is actually running it to, you know, just actually selling your business completely. So I mean, yeah. you, you needed to have a, you know, a solid exit plan, you know, in place or a transition plan and, um, did, did you, did you find that, well, I'm, you, you kind of alluded to this, that it, it was pretty easy because you just kind of stepped out and hoped it would run by itself. But, you know, a lot of founders are like, you know, they, they almost, they step out, but it's like, they've still got a, you know, the, a, an attachment to it. They still got one hand back in it and they're still trying to, you know, run it and, and, and they never really kind of let go and, and let it, you know, kind of grow to that next phase. But yeah. have you, have you found, I mean, you, you said you did have to step back in there. So what's, what's your advice to the founders that are stepping out like you did into something else? Yeah, I would say to, uh, I mean, one, be really clear on what you're willing to let go of. Mm. Uh, and then w one of my most recent mentors, you know, the thing he taught me about businesses, don't ever attach emotionally to it. And I don't, I didn't understand it at the first time I heard it, but uh, I do very, very, very much. So now is, yeah. is, is, is you can't be emotionally attached, especially if you want to step away. All right. And uh, I think just putting the right processes in place is, is probably the most important piece uh, in really setting the frame and understanding that uh, whether it's your team or your clients, like they're not going to understand you. Mm. So it, even though, Hey, you know, exactly what you want to do. They might not know it. You know, so I think back to, Last year, even though we had dealt with uh, the you know, pandemic and everything else going on, one of my goals has always been to move and live in a Southern state. So moving down in, into Florida, spend time down there. Um, and I made the jump last year. We, my wife and I went and we lived down for the winter in Florida. But that moment was prefaced by probably 12 to 14 months worth of buildup, yeah. yeah. preparing to it of, you know, I put in a a weekly vision email that became my, my main communication source with the team every single week. I mm -hmm. uh, started to slowly step back from some things, not be present all the time. Uh, and that really set the stage for that moment. Uh, and if I didn't do that, it would probably would not have gone very well. Right. It would, it would have been like the first time, you know, the first time we just kind of stepped back and that didn't, it, it didn't bode very well for us. So what do you see in the next, uh, say 12 to 18, 24 months for your, for your training business? Yeah, so uh, training business uh, of where we are um, in our facility is to continue to grow and scale at a manageable pace. Uh, you know, now that I'm a little bit stepped back, that's I guess that's a new obstacle is growing and scaling the business without just me driving it, mm -hmm. you know, and empowering other people to drive mm -hmm. it and you know giving them the right uh, task responsibilities and also confidence to do it. Uh, so that's really the plan for us there. Uh, and again, not being emotionally attached to it that. I don't need to have my ego in it, you know, in the, in the gym world is you got to have the biggest, best, most revenue. And like, I've 
let go of that. Like we need to have a really great business that delivers amazing results to our clients. It keeps our team employed and they have amazing time when they're here. Um, and it's very profitable um, you know, for, for the company and for the people who work for it. Uh, and then on the consulting side would be to continue to grow that and you know, step into you know, more of a role there uh, and eventually be able to have a team there uh, that are helping to service more clients and more gyms because after the last year, we really need it. Well, as we wrap up today, I, I'm really curious to, uh, you know, you, you've probably touched on, on some of these things, but is, is there like that one golden nugget that you would like leave with, you know, current or future business owners that might be listening to this, that might be a little further behind you kind of on the journey that you'd say, Hey, this is, this is my one, this is my Yoda wisdom. I'm going to, I'm going to leave with you, you know, Luke Skywalker, as I, um, what are, what is one thing that you think would be a really sound piece of advice that, that, you know, now that you wish you would have known when you started your business? Yeah, I would say something that I know now and wish I knew in the beginning, uh, would be to pay other people to learn high level skill sets in, in investing in, you know, coaching mentorship courses, and, you know, learn from people who have these desirable skill sets that you want and be willing to pay to acquire them because, you are going to make that back exponentially over time. Um, and, and, and that's something that I think a lot of people miss out on is just, they think, oh, I, I can do this on my own. If you move a lot faster when you have someone to show you the way, you know, if someone's got the map there, I, I would take it. Uh, and just one little thing to add to that is, uh, is do what you say you're gonna do. I think that's like my, my, my just said life advice for anyone. Yeah. Uh, I feel like, especially in the last, you know, three to four years, it gets worse and worse business wise of people not following through. So if you mm -hmm. can be that person who's always following through, it's going to help you stand out. Uh, I think that's probably the best thing overall is just always follow through and, you know, under promise over deliver. So I told you this the last question, but you, your answer was so good. Now you're going to make me ask another follow-up question right after <laughs> that. So how did you determine, or how do you determine a good person to, to spend that money on, to invest in yourself? How do you decide between, you know, this guy is a just a scam artist and this guy really knows what he's doing. How did you kind of vet that? Yeah, uh, I think taking the time to follow their content, to look up what they've done to, you know, if it's something about businesses, look at their businesses, the previous businesses they've owned, yeah, talk to people, talk to the people they've worked with. You know, I think that's another one. Like even when people contact me, uh, that's why I always ask, like, is there someone, one of my clients or previous clients you'd like to speak to? Like, I'll connect you. And, you know, I think 99.9% .9 of the time it, they come back, Hey, I talked to so-and-so. It was a great conversation. Like, let's get started. Uh, I, I really think that is probably the, the, the biggest thing is just to do your research first yep. and, and make sure that you're well aware of everything, you know, in that person's past. And also that you resonate with them uh, on a value system too. Because uh, even though the person might have the knowledge you want, if if you guys don't, I guess gel. If you know if you don't have that good rapport and it just it's not a good connection, then it's probably not going to be a good business opportunity either. Oh, that that is absolute gold. You know, we wrap it up today. So Ryan, if if I'm a gym owner, if I you know kind of in that space and I I want to you know find out more about the the consulting that you do, where's the best place to find that online? Yeah, social media, um, Instagram is just at Ryan Obernesser. So just my first and last name. Uh, and then jimprofittakeoff.com uh, website about the mentorship program that I offer. You can check everything out there. Well, Ryan, thanks again for uh, just, just taking time today and sharing your story and, and eat much more than that. I mean, just it was almost like a mini master class here that on, on uh, you know, business lessons, lessons learned and, and things to do to, to really kind of move the needle. But Man, I just really appreciate you taking the time and just helping all boats rise in a rising tide. Ryan, have a great week. Yeah, thank you very much. Another episode in the books. We hope you heard some great takeaways. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review on iTunes and YouTube. As always, thanks for listening to Rising Tide.